self-protection. Even though Jonathan, Jonathan Masters might otherwise be guilty of resisting arrest under instruction number one, menacing under instruction number two, or disorderly conduct under instruction number three, if at the time of those acts, Jonathan Masters believed that Joel Cassie was about to use physical force up, upon him and that Jonathan Ma Masters was privileged to use such force against Joel Cassie as he believed necessary in order to protect himself against the physical force, then you shall find Jonathan Masters not guilty. Instruction number seven, unanimous verdict. The verdict of the jury must be unanimous and must be signed by one of you as four person. You may use the forms provided at the end of these instructions to in writing your verdicts. And there's a signature line for me and a date. We're gonna go through the instruction forms just to be sure we've been through them together. Verdict under instruction number one, resisting arrest. Not guilty. We, the jury, find the defendant, Jonathan Masters, not guilty under instruction number one. If that is your unanimous verdict, the four person will sign that uh, line there. Uh, next is guilty, uh, confinement only. We, the jury, find the defendant, Jonathan Masters, guilty under instruction number one, and fix his punishment at the fix his punishment at confinement in the county jail for blank days. That's not to exceed 365 days. And again, a signature line for the four person. Fine only. We, the jury, find the defendant, Jonathan Masters, guilty under instruction number one, and fix his punishment at a fine of blank dollars, not to exceed 500. And again, a uh, signature line for the four person. Lastly is guilty, confinement, and fine. We the, we, the jury, find the defendant, Jonathan Masters, guilty under instruction number one, and fix his punishment at confinement in the county of jail for blank days and a fine of blank dollars, and the penalty is not to exceed, exceed 365 days and $500 in your discretion. And again, a signature line. Uh, verdicts under instruction number two, not guilty. We, the jury, find the defendant, Jonathan Masters, not guilty under instruction number two. And if that's your verdict, again, a signature line for the four person. Uh, guilty, confinement only. We, the jury, find the defendant, Jonathan Masters, guilty under instruction number two, and fix his punishment in the confinement in the county jail for blank days, uh, not to exceed 90 days. And again, a signature line. Uh, guilty, fine only. We, the jury, find the defendant, Jonathan Masters, guilty under instruction number two, and fix his punishment at a fine of blank dollars. That's not to exceed $250. And again, a signature line. Guilty confinement and fine. We, the jury, find the defendant, Jonathan Masters, guilty under instruction number two, and fix his punishment at confinement in the county jail for blank days and a fine of blank dollars. The penalty is not to exceed 90 days jail or $250 at your discretion. And again, a signature line. Verdict under instruction number three, disorderly conduct in the second degree. Not guilty. We, the jury, find the defendant, Jonathan Masters, not guilty under instruction number three, and a signature line. Guilty, confinement only. We, the jury, find the defendant, Jonathan Masters, guilty under instruction number three, and fix his punishment at confinement in the county jail for blank days. Penalty not to exceed 90 days. Again, a signature line. Guilty, fine only. We, the jury, find the defendant, Jonathan Masters, guilty under instruction number three, and fix his punishment at a fine of blank dollars. Uh, penalty is not to exceed $250. Again, a signature line for the four person. Uh, guilty, confinement, and fine. We, the jury, find the defendant, Jonathan Masters, guilty under instruction number three, and fix his punishment in the, at confinement in the county jail for blank days and a fine of blank dollars. Penalty not to exceed 90 days jail, or 90 days and a $250 fine at your discretion. And again, a signature line for the four person. All right. And for the defense? Yes, Your Honor. All right. Thank you. Mr. Stegmaier? Yes. Can I have a moment to set up my house? For sure. My exhibit, please. Thanks. Your Honor, maybe we approach. All right. They're getting ready. Just to eliminate it as a possibility, and that will happen after closing. All right. No problem. Thank no. you. All right. Sorry.
Members of the jury, John Masters, on December 7th, 2012, was protecting himself. Unfortunately, he didn't do a very good job. On the day in question, he was just walking to the store. Now let's back up a second. We talked in vaude here about whether or not police officers have special treatment. And we all agreed that they do, okay? They have authority, and we have to obey that authority. But it's not fair for the police to create a condition that causes a possible crime to be committed. There's two different sides of this incident as we have it, aren't there? Okay, we've got John. John was going to walk to the store. Just wanted a beer, just wanted a snack. Just walked into the store. Calm, cool, collected as he testified. Maybe a little bit sad, but fair enough. He just had a little disagreement with his girlfriend. He lives in a dangerous neighborhood. And that being so, I'm, I'm sure he's always kind of looking out for things that might happen. Live in a dangerous neighborhood, that's how it goes down. That also happens when you work in a dangerous neighborhood, especially when you're assigned for the sole purpose of apprehending violent criminals. So you're always on alert. The police that are assigned to that Viper unit are always on alert. We heard Detective Browning talk about the state of mind that they're in. So let's go to their part of the, the incident for a second. They're driving down M Street. And they see a bicycle dart across the street. It's pitch black out, not a lot of light. They see this bicycle in the rear view. It piques Detective Cassie's interest. And already their level of alert goes up a little bit because they're looking for something. Then the call comes out, robbery of progress. Those tones drop, bam. Like Detective Browning said, the adrenaline just goes up, okay? Detective Cassie, he's like, that's our guy. We got to go get him. He's looking in the rear view, making this U-turn, and bam, all of a sudden, stop. Because they almost run into John. Now, they're everywhere. Everyone in that car, their adrenaline's at high alert. And John's adrenaline starts rushing too because he almost just got hit by a car. So, who says the first thing? It's Detective Browning, he yells, get the fuck out of the way. Well, okay, fair enough, he's trying to get somewhere. But he doesn't tell him he's a police officer, he's like, not like, police, we gotta go, get out of the way, nothing like that, nothing to identify that there's an emergency doesn't flip on the blue lights trying to go to an emergency, nothing like that, nothing to identify themselves to John as a police officer. Now in response to, to this almost being hit with the car and whether or not you believe that there was an expletive dropped by Detective Browning, it's really immaterial, okay? But these guys almost hit John with the car. Not on purpose, but John doesn't know that. So he raises his arm and says, fuck you. Well, that's when Detective Cassie, well, let me back up a second. The robbery comes out, it's not, it's not their guy, it's not the bicyclist, okay? They know now that it's not the bicyclist, but it could have been something else. Detective Cassie testified that it could have been anything. It could have been a um, dope deal that just went down, he could have just robbed somebody. It could have been anything that occurred in that alley. That piqued his interest right away. But he didn't have an interest in that person anymore. He had an interest in this jaywalker who yelled an expletive at him, threw his hands up, allegedly in a threatening manner, although how threatening is that really? That shows anger, not threat. And he says, we were going to call his bluff. So he decided he was going to stop and, and call John's bluff at that particular time. Now what that means exactly, I don't know. Was he gonna come charging out and start yelling at him? Anything? Nonetheless, he 
He doesn't pull to the side of the road. He pulls right here. And then he starts to get out of his car. Okay? Now that's where it gets a little hazy. That's where you, you, you start talking about when they yelled police, if they yelled police. But you know, John, by this point in time, had already been almost hit by a car, had already had somebody yell at him. Okay? And does he hear police, police, police as he's moving up here? All he knows at this time is there's some thug in a white car that almost hit him that might be trying to cause him physical harm now because that person's mad at him. Remember, John lives in a dangerous neighborhood. The police work in a dangerous neighborhood. John's coming up. He's ready to protect himself at this point in time. And he's, he's, not, he's tall, but he's not a very stocky guy. He's got to get that first shot in or he doesn't know what's going to happen. So he comes up. If he heard police, 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 he said he didn't at that time. He said he did later on. But things are happening so fast, and like one of the detectives, I think it was Detective Cassie testified to, you know, when your adrenaline's going and things are like that, you have trouble seeing, you have trouble hearing. But there's other clues that you can look for. And John told you what they were. And those were available to Detective Cassie and Detective Browning. There were the blue lights on the inside of the car. If you're gonna stop somebody, turn on your lights, let them know you're a police officer. Now, why the badge is worn under the coat for Detective Cassie and Detective Browning wears his right here because it's important for everybody to know that you're a police officer, I don't know. I didn't ask him why. You know, who am I to judge? But you know what? That's fair. It's fair to let everybody know that you're a police officer if you're a police officer, if you're going to get out quickly on them in a heated situation. John didn't know at that point in time that he was a police officer. So he didn't see a badge, he didn't see blue lights, he didn't see a t-shirt with police on it, didn't see a takedown with police on it, or a takedown jacket, a jacket that he would have put on that said police. He saw nothing that indicated this was a police officer. At this point in time, John thought he was a common thug. He had to get that first shot in. Bam, he hits him. And Detective Cassie responded. He responds by driving him backwards. And at this point in time, they're fighting, they're fighting, they're fighting. And then Detective Browning gets out of the car as well. Now, you saw the picture of Detective Browning. I'll show it to you right now. First, I'll show you Detective Cassie, okay? And when you go back to the jury room and deliberate, you'll get a chance to look at it closer, but you'll see no police markings, especially if I show it to you in the blink of an eye. You won't know. Detective Browning comes up, and that is how he was dressed that day. He did have that badge because he knew it's important to identify himself as a police officer, not only visually, or not only auditorily, but visually. It's important to see. You need that recognition because anybody could yell police. But while John's being backed up by Detective Cassie, how is he supposed to focus his attention on somebody else who's coming to join this altercation and see that badge. It, it just doesn't happen. Okay, remember, when your adrenaline's up and you're in a situation like that, you can't see as well and you can't hear as well. The detectives told you that. That's why they train for them to be able to do such things. Now keep in mind, John's not even under arrest at this time. All he's doing is engaging in a physical altercation with some guys he thought tried to run him over and he thought were trying to hurt him. At no point, at no point, was he ever told that he was under arrest. And how do we know this? Well, John told you he never heard you're under arrest. He told him he was, it was his understanding it was under arrest once he saw that badge and once um, 
they were trying to put handcuffs on him. I mean, that's an obvious sign at that point in time, right? 